Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're now entering a session for the next one and a half hours about promoting and teaching evidence-based medicine in different cultures and at different levels. Um, so both for patients and clinicians and a, a range of different contexts. And I'm very pleased that we have a pair of excellent speakers um, to talk to us about that today, Amanda Burles and Giordano Perez Gaxiola, um, who are working together um, on a project called CASP, C-A-S-P, Critical Appraisal Skills Program. Um, and Amanda is uh, a public health physician who has worked, uh, she's now based in Oxford, worked on the public understanding of health information. And uh, Giordano is a pediatrician in Sinaloa in Mexico um, and is uh, someone who has been promoting critical appraisal skills uh, within the profession. And um, I think the discussion will take us through the different levels at which understanding of evidence-based medicine um, needs to be improved. So over to you, Amanda and Giordano. Thank you very much. Good morning. So we're going to talk about today about promoting and teaching evidence-based healthcare in different settings and different cultures. This is basically what we're going to talk about today, identify local cultural aspects that can be of help when promoting evidence-based healthcare. We're going to choose educational strategies to teach evidence-based healthcare, and we're going to try to understand the power of learner-focused fo problem-based teaching. So let me begin by showing you this slide. Today is the other one. You all celebrate it, right? No? Anybody? Anybody celebrate the other one? One, two, three, okay. four. Oh, there are a few. I guess countries are different. Country and culture are worlds, worlds on, on its own. So evidence-based medicine and teaching evidence-based medicine ha has to be appropriate for each situation and each co culture. This is a nice infographic. It's not really evidence-based, but it's a nice infograph where you can see the gap between the education in Mexico and the UK in health, quality of life. So we can see a lot of differences between a lot of countries. So let me begin with, by showing you the Mexican coat of arms. This symbol represents very well the magical side of the Mexican culture, the spiritual side, side of the Mexican culture. It's in our flag, it's in our pesos, in our currency, it's everywhere. Legend has it that Huitzilopochtli, which was one of the gods of the Aztecs, he asked them to find a place where, a, where an eagle will be devouring a snake. It, was, it would be a remote place where the Aztecs will settle down. And they looked for it, and they found, found it, and this is how Tenochtitlan was born. Tenochtitlan will later become one of the biggest cities or largest cities in the world, which is Mexico City. This is the Aztec Empire. As you can see, it spreads almost all of south of Mexico. Here is Mexico City. And the Aztecs back then were not the only tribe. There were a lot of tribes but the Aztecs were the more powerful one and dominated until the Spanish came. When the Spanish came, all of the enemies of the Aztecs joined them to fight the Aztecs. And by the end of the Spanish conquest, half of the Mexican indigenous population were killed. Still today, as you can see, we have 62 ethno-linguistic groups in Mexico. That's quite a few. 61 plus the Spanish group. So this represents around 10% of the population in Mexico. It's around 10 million. A very small percentage of this population go on and study, and study careers and study medicine, very small percentage, or study nurse, nursing. And others go on and study, well, practice traditional medicine. As you can see, we have, we have a lot of diversity in our, in our culture. Uh, let me talk about a little about healthcare in Mexico. Healthcare in Mexico is divided into three main parts. The first one is the government, which cover, 
covers all of people that are, are not insured. Then we have a social secu security with a lot of organisms and the private sector. The government is the one that cares for the indigenous people. And as you can see, it's almost half of the population in Mexico. The government covers almost half, half of the people <coughs> that are uninsured. <laughs> Bless you. So, do you think having a very diverse culture may influence the public health or health decisions in a country? What do you think? Let's talk about with your neighbor for maybe 30 seconds. Go on. What do you think? Okay then, maybe we have time for one or two opinions. What do you think? Anyone wants to raise their hand? Their hand? Do you think this really matters? Yes? Okay, this happened in July. I saw this news on, on a newspaper, then I saw it on the internet, and let me translate it for you. It says, doctors in Amealco are cured of the scare. You wonder what, what's that? Because of cultural and ideolo ideological differences, the indigenous patient may be considered ingenious or crazy, and he may not receive medical attention. <laughs> there we go. Indigenous population continu continuously suffer diseases that allopathic medicine doesn't recognize. So what they're saying is that when the indigenous people come to the doctor, they come with a chief complaint like this, like el susto, the scare, or el mal de ojo, the curse of the eye, or el empacho, something, maybe I can translate it like bloat, bloating. So when they come to the doctor with these complaints, the doctor doesn't believe him or believe them. So they don't get proper medical attention. So when I saw this news, I thought it was, it was, it was good. They're teaching a, a workshop with intercultural focus on in health services. I thought, well, maybe they're teaching about differences in ideology. They're teaching us, the doctors, to be more sensitive, be more empathic. And they're trying to translate the chief complaint, the indigenous, indigenous chief, chief complaint to allopathic terms so we can provide care. That's what I thought. But I, want, I wanted to, to learn more, so I called the, doc, the organizer of this workshop, and they were very kind, very open, and they, they even said, send me their slides. Turns out, they were not teaching this. They, were, they did teach about empathy and, sensi and sensibility, but the doctors, they were encouraging doctors to learn about traditional diagnosis and traditional therapies. And they were encouraging them to learn about traditional medicine, about herbs, homeopathy, Reiki, back flowers, etc. A lot of complementary things. And remember, this workshop was organized by the government. Granted, it was a local effort or, or local part of the, of the government, but this is the one that covers almost half of the population in Mexico. So it's quite a shock to me. Now, as you can see, we have magic permeate in our health system. Now, a quick note on medical education in Mexico. We have 74 medical schools all, all around Mexico. And so if you think about it, we have quite a few, a few thousand doctors, new doctors per year. Are they qualified to do or practice evidence-based medicine? Or do they have critical, crit, critical appraisal skills? The reality is no. In 2001, there was a questionnaire done to more than 500 res residents of different specialties. And the score 
was 34. And 24% even graded worse than if they, if they had answered at random. So there have been a, a few other questionnaires in the last few years, and the results are almost the same. In all of Mexico, which, as you saw, we have a population of over 110 million people. We only have 1,000 active in medical research. And in the state where I work in, which is Sinaloa, where there are almost 3 million people, we have five doctors involved in medical research. So as you can see, we have a very diverse culture, a very magical environment. So could we use this to promote and teach evidence-based healthcare in such a magical culture? We need a help. As, as you saw, we needed a lot, of, a lot of help. So what we did, we called Batman, I mean Amanda and Cast International to come help us out. Amanda. Okay, thank you. So um CASP International Network went to Mexico, and not for the first time. Uh, CASP stands for Critical Appraisal Skills Program, and this is the logo, uh, Find, Appraise, and Act on Evidence. Um, who here has been to a CASP workshop? Mm. Who here has used uh, CASP checklists? Okay. Uh, CASP started in Oxford in 1993 and it built on the Canadian experience so Larry Chambers came over and worked with Rory Milne and I had just started as a registrar in public health medicine and was lucky enough to go to that workshop. The, the project was started as a top-down initiative as a response to an analysis. In the late 80s they'd had um, projects for getting research into practice and they'd analysed the barriers. And one of the major barriers was managers didn't understand the need for evidence and weren't aware of the importance of it. And so the original CASP was designed to raise awareness about the need for research evidence. Um, um, we also wanted people to know that, you know, just because you found a paper on a topic, it doesn't mean that it's valid. And uh, we wanted to use systematic reviews. So all the initial CASP workshops were all done with systematic reviews because we're trying to promote their use in policy making. And a subsidiary and uh, not the most important element of the workshop was for people to actually learn critical appraisal skills. An aim of the workshop was not this, but it turned out to me to be one of the most interesting elements that it could turn dysfunctional groups into functional groups. So um, pharmacist uh, information service, um, you know, I once went to talk to them about CASP and they said it would never work here, we've got a hierarchy, we've got this, we've got that, you can't ever do this. And I'd say to them, you don't think that actually having a way of appealing to objective knowledge might help with this? And they went on to run some CASP workshops and in fact found them quite useful. Uh, the teaching approach, as some of you will know, is that they're workshops, they're usually about 20 in a workshop, they can be anywhere between well, it says 8 and 30 up here, but I have actually been done them for 300 people. Um, we try and make them multidisciplinary and go out to the workplace because evidence-based change requires all members of the team to be able to talk to each other and work together. It's very hard to be a sort of uh, evidence-based practitioner in isolation. They're usually half a day. They're problem-based and they're interactive, they have small group work, and they involve the critical appraisal of a, a paper. Um, people get a pack in advance that they're asked to read, and then the workshop takes a very similar structure that, you know, we give people coffee, make them happy. Introductory talk, which is interactive, looking at what their learning needs are. They go off and they appraise a paper in small groups, and then they come back and discuss it in a group with a, an evaluation at the end. This is about the dynamics of changing groups. We try and include patients and consumers and health service users in these groups, and they bring an important value. And this is a comment from one of the lay members of the Maternity Services Liaison Committee that we trained as part of the Changing Childbirth Trust. Um, it says, as a lay member, um, who finds the quarterly meeting somewhat above my head. I was pleased to work more closely with the health professionals. I shall feel more confident in the future. 
I have always had things I wanted to say, now I find I have a voice. So the philosophy of the way that CASP teaches is it builds on the expertise of the group and, and you do that by being interactive and listening to what the group wants. It's very pragmatic, so we try and avoid a sort of theoretical, is this a brilliant piece of academic research when we critically appraise a paper? We're problem-based and we ask the question, is there anything useful in this paper that will inform the decision that I have to make? Um, small doses, half a day, and we all make sure it's really fun because we don't think a half-day workshop is going to turn somebody into a, an experienced evidence-based practitioner. So we want them to come back for more, and they do. They've come back for more. The critical appraisal skills program was incredibly successful. And I don't mean by this that we've got evidence that we changed patient outcomes. I wish we did. But I'm talking about in terms of the evaluations, which were just uh, satisfaction. People loved them, great use of their time. Um, they thought their knowledge had gone up tremendously. Um, they go on and do more and more workshops. Um, culture and organizations changed. And we kept getting more and more requests for, for CASP workshops. So this was an Oxford-based program, and we kept getting requests. Initially, um, they came from the United Kingdom. In 2005, when I first made this slide, there were 1.3 million staff, healthcare staff, in the United Kingdom, in the NHS. Uh, and it was growing every year. And I looked it up for last year, and it's 1.43 million. It may go down now with the, with the slash and burn politics of this time, but who knows? But just based on the 2005 figures, um, assuming that you have four workshops to be fully trained, one on randomized control trials, systematic reviews, diagnostic tests or qualitative studies or economic evaluation, but four is enough. And we have 20 participants per workshop, one a day, five days per week, 46 weeks a year, and no staff turnover. I calculated it would take over a thousand years before CASP could have trained um, the uh, N current NHS employees. So we developed a cascade model. When people ask us for workshops, we said, look, we've got more than enough to do in the Oxford region. But if you show us that you are thinking about putting into place a systematic training system, we will come and work with you, deliver some early workshops, and help you deliver your own. Um, and every workshop we've ever run on the evaluations, every single workshop's evaluated. On the last page, it has this question. If you, would, uh, if you want to be interested in um, coming to further training and blah, 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 please leave your name. And one of our markers of excellence is how many people leave their name. In Spain, more than half the people uh, leave their names. And the CAS cascade has worked. So we, these, these are formal cascades down this side. The very first one was to the National Childbirth Trust. Years ago now, Ian Chalmers told them if they really wanted to make an impact on how childbirth was, they needed to make themselves evidence-based, and they went on and did it. And then we had South and West region. So if you notice, the early ones were in the United Kingdom, gradually going further afield, and um, Mexico. We, we also did one-off workshops or a couple of events which were not kind of training cascades, not associated with the training the trainer and then helping them run their own workshops for a while. And we have training weeks where we come and we do a lot of training the trainer and we go through all the workshop structures. And here, they, here are the ones we've had. Um, quite extraordinary. This is the Visegrad one. This is uh, Rita Horvath, a most dynamic and energetic woman who organized this as part of a uh, program she was doing. We had 30 uh, Central and Eastern European countries and quite a lot. So this is Norbert Biltz. He went on to set up CAS Polska. P Peter Bradley, I think that's at the back. He, he went and worked in Norway and that there are lots of other people there. Um, I just want to tell you about Vimbai. Vimbai came out of his own steam to the Oxford 2008 CASP workshop, which was hosted by the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine as part of the How to Teach EBM Week. He's a delightful man, and his research interest, he stated, as information literacy in evidence-based practice, and he found the week extraordinarily useful. He went back and he carried out the most amazing program across the whole of uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in fact was all awarded an international award for his services to the information community. I just want to mention him because as a single individual he made a huge impact and I want to pay tribute to him because it was a tragedy for us all that he was died in a road traffic accident earlier this year. 
I'm mad about CASP. This is a workshop run in the United States because um, I wanted to run it. So I got my dad to be a small group facilitator, my brother, my mum, and it was run in the local um, library. All my family live in the United States, I might add, so we just did it. This is Cass Spain. Uh, Juan Cabello came to UK and we happened to share an office. He came for a totally different purpose, but when he went back, I'd managed to infect him. And instead of going back to do what he was supposed to do, he went back and set up CASP in Spain, and he lives in Alicante, and this is the organizing nodes. And there are now training organizations in all these autonomous regions. Um, and in this Cascade Works, they've trained over 7,000 people. Um, they've got 500 different people who've been small group facilitators. That means they've come to at least two workshops because they're identified at the first workshop. 200 people have been trained as trainers, and over 100 have actually done, trained other people. With Peter Bradley in Norway, Juan Cabello in Spain, myself, um, we kept getting more and more requests. So we, we set ourselves up as the CASP International Network. This is an organization that has absolutely no legal status. And it was just a group of friends with a common attitude to evidence-based healthcare, an excuse to get together. So it says a non-profit making organization. Um, Yes, we, we, we don't make any money. And then mostly we go out and do this because we have a passion for it. Um, very, very rarely have we been paid. DFID paid us to go to Hungary on the first trip to Mexico. But, um, so th this is the website, and this gives our aims to collaborate, to help those undertaking health and social care decisions make sense of scientific evidence and to act accordingly, to create a multidisciplinary network which supports college teaching critical appraisal and related skills, to develop and support independent organizations running local workshops to help people develop skills to find, critically appraise, and act on evidence and social care. And we've not done very well on this, to seek funding to promote the organization's activities. We still do it on a shoestring. Uh, to develop and disseminate successful new teaching materials and methods, uh, and to improve the evidence base of our own practice. Um, so, three organizations CASP in Birmingham, CASP in Oxford, and CASP in Spain responded to the cry for help from Mexico and, and trotted off as, as the CASP International Network. So I guess we got infected too by Amanda and, and colleagues. Uh, from the start, I noticed that they use really peculiar or particular examples or during the workshops. For instance, they use this dust, <laughs> I don't know how, how do you call it, powder, uh, which is called maiden's blood. This is to po supposed to make women lo love you or enchant women. And they use this to run the RCT, the randomized control trial workshop. They, they, they only ask, how would you prove that this works? And since then, we've been using examples like this in our workshops. Uh, we learn from them, but they, they also learn from us a few things like, like this. This is Amanda from CAS International, and this is Jose from CAS Spain. But anyway, <laughs> since then we've been using this uh, example or this uh, model, and we use traditional remedies like tolachi, which is a love potion, and Trevor Rojo, which cures hot pl flashes for women in the menopause. And we asked the, the, the students, how would you prove that these things work? How would you choose your subjects? How, how would, you, would you select or allocate them? How would you follow them? It all leads to the randomized control trial, and we're using examples that, very, that are very local in the community. And depending on the, on the audience, we also use questionable devices, or if there's a fad in town during that time, we use that fad to try to teach about critical appraisal skills. We've also done working with the Tecnológico de Monterrey, which is one of the main universities in Mexico. We've done some uh, internet workshops, similar to with the CAS methodology. We've trained over right now over 400 people all around Mexico. And this is a, 
an example that I personally like to use in where I work because this is a very, very spicy, very spicy, but very delicious plate in, in Mexico, in, in the region where I live. It's called aguachile. It can be translated to water, uh, chili water or pepper water. Uh, it's very good, but it's very spicy. And since most patients and mo most practitioners think spicy food uh, worsens hemorrhoid sim symptoms, we ask them to look for the evidence about, on, on this. So frame your PICO questions. Does spi eating spicy food really worsens the hemorrhoid symptoms? And they're usually, usually surprised with the, when they find that there is a double-blind randomized control trial about this. It's very interesting. Uh, so this is where I live, in Culiacán. It's a small city, well, it's a city of almost a million habitants. It has one of the most beautiful sunsets in the world, but sadly most, one of the worst reputations. This is where I work. It's a public hospital, and it's a children's public hospital. And we also have magic here. This happened on the last World Cup. Mexico was playing Uruguay. And as you can see, this is in, in, in one of the meeting rooms of the hospital. We were watching the game. And as you can see, there's an upside down sign here. Some candles or all has prayers for Mexico to win. Of course, Mexico lost the game. So that's evidence that the upside down saints and candles don't work. But then, anyway, in our hospital, they, they let me or let us uh, form an EVM department, which we're doing simil similar things to the neonatologist that works with Paul Glasio. Uh, we're coordinating classes and workshops. We're also organizing journal clubs, especially with the neonatology, the oncology, and the infectious disease departments. Since we don't have a librarian, I sort of serve like an, a li librarian. And we also created this continuity clinic. This was a big gap in our residency. Uh, residents did not have a, uh, a follow-up over, or of their patients. So we adapted this office. As you can see, there's a one-way mirror there. So it sort of works like a police station or a police movie. One of the teachers is, is here. The, the patients are aware that they're being watched. But it gives the residents freedom to act like themselves but also we can supervise them. And after the consultation, they go on to the next room and they talk with us and we are using the educational prescription to formulate PICO questions and then discuss them later. And we also have a EBM course, online course using an open source platform. And so we're trying to take every angle possible to try to infiltrate the evidence-based medicine or evidence-based healthcare into our society. Now. So we'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to do this talk. And when I was first invited, I, used, I usually like to do talks where I choose the topic. And I thought, oh yeah, evidence-based healthcare in different cultures, I can do that. But when I came to think about what is it that I'm actually doing and have I ever done anything special? I started to have my doubts. and I went through a great angst about not wanting to do this talk. Has anyone here taught in a country other than their own? Right, at least half of you. And did you modify what you did because you were in another country? Keep your hands up if you did. I don't know, um, does anyone, anyone, there's supposed to be a roving mic. Do you want, do you want to tell us what you did, Ruth, for the, to modify? What? Hi, I'm, I'm Ruth Gilbert from the Centre for Evidence-Based Child Health in London, UCL. And we've been teaching running courses in a number of different countries, but most recently a sort of four or five year programme in India. And what we tend to do there, I mean, it's a, a, along Amanda's model where we're very much working with a team, a faculty team in India of, of very able paediatricians who have also been coming to work with us as tutors here in London. 
Um, but the way we've modified the program there is really about relevance and the sorts of um, topics we've been dealing with and the types of papers. Um, so, so that's the answer. Okay, and I, I noticed Catherine Meads, the director of, or ex-director, most recent director of CAS Birmingham, uh, also had your hand up. Catherine? Uh, yes, Catherine Meads. Um, the exa example I would give is uh, I've been recently been teaching in Georgia, uh, a small country near Turkey, and that was to uh, health professionals and government decision makers and um, providers and purchasers of services. And the tailoring, I used a lot of the CASP workshop um, teaching materials because I, um, I, I used those for many years. Um, but a lot of the tailoring is to do with local language and local understanding of um, things that people would find normal in uh, English language but very strange in other languages. So for instance, the difference between uh, assessment and appraisal, um, they're the same word in some languages, but in English they're two different words. So you have to spend quite a lot of time over uh, just small things like that so that they have to have time to develop their own language to understand the difference between the two concepts. Thanks, Catherine. Um, one of the things that I've found, in, I mean, I haven't done nearly the amount you're doing, but um, blinding and double blinding is a culturally problematic term, and I found sometimes one had to take some time to explain that as well. It's also not only culturally problematic, but in terms of, you know, dis disability, um, some people find that in a sort of problematic term as well, so yeah. I don't know if you had that. So there, there are problems with words that don't translate. I mean, evidence-based medicine is, is rather a funny um, thing in, in, in Spanish because um, evidence is what's obvious and um, not something that you need research for. So, so there are odd things about adapting the language. You clearly want to do clinical problems that are adapted to the local environment. And these are important things. And I have been all over the world and I've taught every shape and color and size and culture and level from you know, consumers to the most senior people. In fact, I was an intervention in a BMJ trial where the, the modal profession was professor and I was giving them a CASP workshop. It was very worrying. And for this talk, I started to worry about how culturally sensitive I had been. And I'm thinking, how culturally sensitive have I been? Uh, and I came to the conclusion I was a one-trick dog. I'd done the same thing everywhere. That all I do is, is, is the CASP. That's all I do. Um, for example, um, when I went to Hungary um, on one workshop, uh, the very first one, and right at the beginning was with Peter Bradley, uh, it involved look, playing a game we call study design game, which involves people moving around a room and chatting in pairs and voting on things. The Hungarians did not want to play. They wanted to sit there quietly, be talked at, and go away with a lot of science. And so when they went off to the coffee break, we took all the chairs away and hid them so that they um, were forced to move around the room. And you can ask yourself, well, is that culturally sensitive? Or is that just imposing your way of doing things on people? It was very interesting in Hungary because everyone had been chosen because they spoke English really well. But it became readily apparent that they didn't speak English really well, not at a level where they could conduct um, a, a scientific discussion together. But that's great about the CAS method. Small group work, talk in your own language. And um, then I get them to talk to each other across the room in their own language and get the groups to come to consensus, and if they come to consensus and they disagree, talk across. And in one game, two groups could not agree, and they were arguing and arguing another. And I was able to say, actually, you're both right, because this group is arguing this for these reasons. And, and they still, we didn't know you spoke Hungarian. What they didn't realize is I had used that example so many times that I knew how the groups would cleave. So it was asking, which is the right study design for this question? And the question was deliberately ambiguous. And if you took it one way, you got one answer. And if you took it the other way, you got another answer. 
So I just knew, knew what they were doing and they loved it and they were laughing and laughing and laughing. I said to Peter Bradley, isn't it funny? I said, you go all over the world and really there's no cultural differences at all. And Peter said, oh, I used to think that, he said, until uh, I went to Oxford. Anyway. <laughs> The Oxford Learning Experience, the How to Teach EBM uh, week set up by Dave Sackett years ago. And in this week, students are supposed to be entirely self-directed in small groups. And although there are tutors, I'm not quite sure what we're supposed to be there for because we're not supposed to, to guide people too much. And this is some feedback we got from a Spanish-speaking group at the end of the week. They said that they were, the beginning of the week, they were thoroughly upset because they had come to Oxford expecting a shower of science because, you know, it's one of the academic centers of the world. But in fact, they found themselves in a boat that was drifting out of control with no captain on board or, and drifting perilously, perilously close to the rocks. In fact, there were two captains on board, myself and Juan Cabello, and we didn't even seem to realize there was a problem. They said about Wednesday, they decided there was no, nothing for it. They would have to take control of the boat themselves, otherwise the, they were going to crash onto the rocks. Um, and in fact, they actually enjoyed the learning experience. We actually, I it, don't actually do the week quite as Dave would like. I actually lend people a hand every so often, and um, you know, if they really don't know what to do, I say, well, why don't you take this paper and run a critical appraisal session with people? So I'm back to my one trick. Uh, uh, and this is, I'm going to tell you about what happened in Mexico. I like to think of myself as a, an iconoclast. The first time I went to Mexico, it was paid for by DFID. It was organized by the um, Ministry of Health. And we had expensive hotels. And we were, it was terribly pompous. And we had trained up some Mexicans already. And so we asked if they could be small group facilitators for our workshops. Oh, no. This was, the government was going to run all this. And it was incredibly pompous. So I decided I would deliver my talk like this. And they just thought I was mad, which I was mad. And in fact, that was a total failure of a rollout. Um, we ran, we run a series of workshops in CASP. And the last one is implementation. We were starting this implementation workshop full of deans of medical schools, lots of people really excited. And the Ministry of Health came down and said, we will tell people how they're going to implement evidence-based practice. This is not for you to do yourselves. So I'm not surprised that they're rolling out um, all these complementary medicines now. Uh, they didn't quite get the hang of it in those days, but nonetheless, we do it now. And this is our EBM cascade. Um, this is, <laughs> can you, do you know who this is? It's, uh, uh, this is when, that's my visa when I went to Iran. This is myself in Iran. When I go to the countries, the best thing in the world is not the pompous receptions with military music in hotels. It's when somebody takes you to their house, often incredibly modest home. We went to Peru and I discovered that these pediatricians had paid for our journey out of their own pockets and they earned a pittance compared with us. And it was, it was, it was very humbling. This is, this is in Tabriz in, in, in Iran. This is, I, was, I went to medical school with Nuria, which was quite amazing. That, her home was in Tabriz. This is Paul Glazier doing a small group session in Tabriz. And actually, these are just some kids who are playing in the street, just like every kid's everywhere. So sometimes it does seem there are no cultural differences. But there are, for example, this is um, Iran. But this is Peru. This is a statue in the middle uh, of, uh, of Lima. Now, you wouldn't find that statue in Iran. So one thing that I do do, I suppose this is my one token um, to cultural sensitivity, is I don't make I, uh, any joke that's anywhere in any way. I use a lot of humor in my presentations, uh, got any sexual content, because all these things you have to you have to really know a language well before you do it. This is, this is um, Yuri Cariazzo, who's a pediatrician who invited us to do a, who ran, runs CAS Peru, invited us to do a, a roll out there. And he always, he gives me these two photos. He said this was his before CAS photo. Before CAS training, he allowed nobody to speak in and they had to be quiet. And if they came in late, they had to go out. And he was, and this is, this is, uh, this is his after CASP training. Um, 
it's, it's quite different. Um, but I wanted to tell my friend Giordano that magical thinking isn't the property of, of Mexico. After one workshop, um, a consumer sent me these tablets and said, I think I've been a bit of a fool. I've paid 50 pounds uh, to, because I've got tinnitus for these tea gone remedies and I think I've been ripped off. And if you look them, lactose and sucrose tablets. And I went on the website and here they are, 97 pounds from 90 day supply of lactose and sucrose. But I was able to help her because it had a money back guarantee and she was actually able to get her money back. And Giordano says that, you know, even the Mexican health service promotes devices that have absolutely no evidence base. Well, this device here is, it emits invisible light. You buy it at Boots, 35 pounds, and it will stop cold sores. My husband bought me one, so I immediately looked up to see what the evidence was. And their evidence is not worth the paper it is written on. There is some evidence. But this is prescribable on the NHS on an FP10. I wrote to Boots and asked them what the evidence base was for selling this to the public. Uh, they haven't written back. So this is CASP International. Well, not quite. It's not a major organization. It is, it's, it's, it, this is actually CASP International. We're a little guerrilla movement. The people who've invited us out, although CASP began as a top-down initiative in Oxford region with money, actually it's run out with no money. People run workshops, they'll charge minimal amounts to the people who come to cover their costs, and they do it out of goodwill. And it's a fantastic way of getting evidence-based practice into countries which are not as wealthy as our own. And all it is, is, is teaching the gorillas how to read critically. So how culturally sensitive have I been? I have been culturally sensitive in the way that um, Ruth talked about in choosing examples that are relevant. So, for example, if I want to talk about Paul Glazew's paper, this is a paper where you can see that less than half the published publications give you enough information to be able to actually reproduce a treatment. And in systematic reviews that we're promoting, it's only about one in ten. So how would I teach that in Mexico? Well, I would take some of what they have lots of wonderful powders in Mexico, and they have these m legitimate powder, this one is, for students. It will produce marvelous changes in the students. But if you look on the back, it says, this will revive your mind, rub it on your temples at the hour of study. But it doesn't say how long to rub it for, what kind of dose, can you overdose on it? You know, how often, it is not, so I will use this example about exactly how would you implement this intervention, assuming that it was evidence-based. And here is from the United Kingdom, Think Gum. Here you can brain Think Gum. I bought this on Oxford High Street last, last week, and it says, for best results, chew while learning and studying, and chew again to recall the information. <laughs> I think we do a little better than the Mexicans, don't you? I think that's you know, slightly more reproducible. So, although uh, Giordano has a, a, a complex about medical uh, magic, I, I can assure him we're just as irrational, or irrational, we, we, we're just as magical here. Now, you, this is a, anyone who's been to a CASP workshop will know that you fill in the yellow evaluation form we have since 1993, why should we change that? So the Spanish ones have exactly the same questions as the English ones, which are one of the questions, the question says, how much did you enjoy the workshop? Not at all, not much, a lot, very much. Now this has got this crossed out and he says, I haven't come here to enjoy myself. <laughs> now when Giordano saw this, he said, that's from Guanajuato, I remember that. Uh, evaluation. It's not from Guanajuato, this is from Spain. But this idea that this is, a, this is a Spanish saying, la letra con sangre entra. With blood, letters go in. I think that Mexico, you, you've been, um, this is, a lot of people have this view, and I think it's their Spanish invaders did it, because this is um, Francisco Goya, this picture is called la letra con sangre entra, and it comes from the 18th century. So you can see that this kind of idea that education has got to be tough and difficult to go in. Actually, this is CASP Spain today. This is one of them. They can have their small groups outside in the sun. This is a workshop in Alicante, uh, a small group appraising a paper. 
This is Ricardo Riera from Cash Venezuela. Um, and they know how to have fun. I mean, this is from the How to Teach EBM Week run by the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. This, this little chap, Antonito, he trains residents. And so he split the room down the side and they had to do a great big forest plot with, with the center being the line of no treatment effect. And they're all uh, blobograms with confidence intervals and they had to move uh, according to what they thought and somebody snapped a picture of him. So they, they know how to have fun. There are lots of these things, and in fact, CASP International has never succeeded in getting any money whatsoever for its work other than a couple of programs from DFID. But I am thrilled to tell you that this, I, this is call money powder, and I'm going to sprinkle it on my next MRC grant application, and um, maybe we'll do better in the future. So they sell all that stuff in the street in Mexico, in all the streets. But I also spotted this when I was in Guanajuato. And this is the University of Guanajuato, Faculty of Civil Engineering. The 83 to 88 gener generation bought this plaque to thank their school for training them in looking for knowledge and truth. So there are a lot of similarities across the world. And this is a photo that was sent to me by some of the students from um, our course last week. Um, this is Jose. When he, people always want us to give us the truth when they've critically appraised the paper, and we never will. Jose always says, the truth's out there. So this person taking the photo said, said to us, where's the truth? And uh, some of us started to point, you know, it's, it's out there. So how culturally sensitive have I been? This, I like this thing. Yes, I know, but the administration wants to appear culturally sensitive. I haven't done this. I haven't adopted... Um, this kind of practice. But I can respect um, traditions um, of other people. So for example, we, um, Catherine and I, um, trained um, 10 or 15 people who came from Iran. Now they were all men. And I think Catherine was a little bit upset. This is why I, I warned Catherine, I had a photo of her, because she thought they don't respect us. They won't even shake our hands. They're really annoyed because we're teaching. So this is Catherine here. <laughs> Uh, and I said, oh, no, actually, it, it, it's quite respectful. It's actually respectful that they're teaching, uh, shaking our hands. But the worst thing about this workshop that we were training we were doing, we were doing it in a building other than our own, and we emailed all our materials over, and they got lost. So we get there to teach, and all our materials are lost. And um, we're teaching one on economic evaluation, weren't we? So I said, it's all right, I've got my USB stick here. And my USB stick had my presentation on, and it was for an English audience, and it was all about a new drug called Get It Up for erectile dysfunction. And I had completely changed it for the audience. So, but interestingly enough, despite these were all men there, and I had my English um, Get It Up example, they didn't. They were very polite anyway. They didn't appear too offended. Sometimes, though, you know, here I'm at going at Casp. This is a. Um, missionary, um, Maori missionary, and I think, you know, are we just going out, you know, typical imperialist imposing our views on everyone else? And this is why I didn't want to do this talk, because I thought, hmm, that's what I've been doing. But then I thought, well, no, at least I've been invited out there. Now, somebody once told me that CASP is like Amway, you know, you get in, I don't know, Americans here know what Amway is, you get in, and you're not allowed to say anything against it. And we are, we're a little cult, and we, we select people through our selection methods, and we all love each other, and we're a bit of a cult. And my um, desire, my, my desire to take over the world knows no bounds. So this is the brochure I have produced for the Oxford International Programme in Evidence-Based Healthcare. And when I told them of the design, um, my colleagues who, who made the brochure for me called, called this pamphlet the final frontier. And you can pick, pick up brochures here and downstairs in the coffee room if you want to know. And here is a teaching week we had yesterday, and this is the teaching philosophy at Oxford. Multidisciplinary, problem-based, enjoyable, interactive, small group work, create a safe environment, demystification and simplification. You don't have to be an expert and use the expertise of others. Does that sound a bit like CASP, doesn't it? I tell you, I am a one-trick dog, but it seems to work with consumers and really great people coming to Oxford. Last week I was teaching about yogurt for irritable bowel syndrome, and I was talking about side effects, and I put a, 
up the results of a study on probiotic, uh, pro probiotics in acute pancreatitis to show that they could have adverse events. Mark Besserling, who's the first author, hadn't dawned on me he's the first author, he's sitting there as one of our students, he said, ah oh, yes. And so he, he proceeded to teach the rest of the class and tell us all about the adverse effects of probiotics. So it's fantastic using the expertise of others. Now, there's a randomized control trial of CASP workshops, and when it was done, I was invited by the steering group, which I was, and I kept saying, you know, they kept wanting to standardize the intervention. I said, you can't standardize this intervention. The whole point is it needs to respond to the needs of participants. The whole time I'm teaching, I'm asking questions, and I'm listening for feedback, I get people to give their objectives and I change what I'm going to cheat in light, teach in the light of those objectives. All the time I'm seeking feedback and trying to adjust in the light of that feedback. So I'm going to hand over to Giordano to conclude. That's the last one, Jen. So we need to identify local cultural aspects that can be of help in promoting and teaching evidence-based healthcare in our countries, in our cultures. We need to choose educational strategies to use evidence-based healthcare depending on the student's background. And as you saw in all the examples about the CAS workshops, we need to understand the power of learner-focused problem-based problem teaching. And if, any, if anybody wants to try some of this, we have available free of charge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda and Giordano. Do you want to come and sit down here and we'll have a, have a session? I, it struck me that last bit, um, uh, Amanda, that the, um, the irony of the fact that you're saying that evaluating the CASP workshops is, you know, it's an evidence-based intervention, or at least uh, it's an evidence-based, uh, it's, it's, it's spreading evidence-based approaches, but actually you're like a complementary medicine and that you can't be properly evaluated by your own techniques because it's, it, it's individual. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you could do a randomised controlled trial. I think I switched this off because I was going to... You could do a randomised controlled trial, but you'd have to do it as a complex intervention. Yes. Uh, it, it, it is a complex intervention. So, so the, the randomised the, trial is happening? There is a randomised controlled trial by Taylor et al. And, you, you know, it's not going out and just spilling the same stuff. So if you wanted to do the randomised control trial, you would have to do it and recognise that it was a complex intervention and you, you don't standardise the intervention in that way. No, quite right. Questions from the audience? There's one there. Thank you very much for your conference. Uh, I'm Marianne from Colombia. Uh, and one of the problems we have uh, with the evidence-based practice in uh, small towns and the countryside, especially our resources, uh, people don't have the uh, possibility to uh, have a computer, internet access, and develop all search uh, skills about uh, looking for the evidence. And I would like to know what suppose uh, what proposals do you have to uh, you know to avoid this problem because people in workshops are very 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 exciting. We have similar experience as you have shown, but our problem is still this uh, lack of resources to identify uh, the evidence. I think we, we have the same problem in a lot of areas in Mexico. Uh, a lot of rural hospitals or rural offices do not have the internet or, or computer access. Uh, I, I feel it's changing in Mexico, so I don't know if, this is, if it's a similar situation in, in Colombia that little by little, uh, little steps that they're providing computers to access the evidence. But other than that, I feel like this has to be taught from the schools and the universities before we get out of school. And it's something that's changing now in Mexico. But now it's uh, an obligatory uh, course during medical school. So. 
I, I think that evidence-based practice is always about using the best available evidence mm -hmm. and sometimes it's not necessarily the best evidence there is but it's, it's the best you can do at the time. Um, the Spanish-speaking countries or South America are lucky because Pajo has at least made the Cochrane Library free to everybody but that does require internet access and the Spanish uh, or the Ibo-American Cochrane Center have translated uh, all the Cochrane reviews into mm -hmm. Spanish which is also helpful because there's also the language barrier I mean English is the uh, language of evidence-based health care par excellence mm -hmm. um, but I think you have, to, you, you have to join together with your colleagues. In fact, Cass Spain are about to do a, a rollout in Colombia with, when we, we are Mexican and other colleagues. So. Do we need to do more to convince governments and institutions to... I mean, if, if one could show real benefit, which I mean, obviously you do show, and your talk gives that very clearly, there's a huge benefit to the individuals who come, and, but, but we find this with our evidence-based products, that actually what people who, who might pay for these things um, need is some kind of return on investment sense that if they if they encourage everyone in your region to go to a CASP workshop and paid for that to happen then they would get the following outcome i.e. this amount of healthcare saving or this amount of better prescribing or this do you know what I mean so it's kind of proving the return on investment somehow do you, do you think we could we need to do a better job of that and if so how I, I think we haven't evaluated evidence-based practice sufficiently um, there's um, a colleague of mine from Spain, um, he, what, they had one um, team decided to become evidence-based and there's fantastic statistics. They have shorter length of stay, they have less readmission rates, they have less deaths and they admit and treat three times as many patients as the other teams. And this is on a random rotor, so it's no selection bias there. It's, it's, and, and every resident fights to get, on, get working in that group. Now, it's an exceptional person that leads that team. Yeah. And whether it's that exceptional person or whether it's evidence-based practice, we won't know until we do the proper studies. Mm. But um, yeah. we, we, need to, we need to do more studies. Other questions? Um, there's one there and then one there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Said Farooq, uh, it's uh, it's not about the uh, about the cultural aspect as such, but I wonder how you could overcome the resistance from the uh, I would say unethical promotion from the you know which is quite prevalent in quite a lot of these countries from the industries, and I wonder whether your program has paid attention to that. I think that is perhaps one of the biggest hurdles. We, we, we can't, just, quite, just, we can't just, quite hear what you're the saying. The acoustic on the stage is slightly hard. Just repeat the question. Uh, what it's, it's, uh, it's not strictly about the cultural aspect of the evidence-based medicine, but I feel that one of the biggest hurdles in applying the evidence-based practice in many of these countries is the uh, lack of regulations about how the interventions are promoted and uh, especially from the pharmaceuticals. I don't know whether you have paid any attention to that or have you encountered that in your practice? So how, how, how teaching people how to deal with pharmaceutical promotion? I think it's very um, insidious of uh, farmers' um, educational activities. And in fact, in Spain, they passed a law where they have to, a farmer has to pay money for independent educational activities and that is actually being used to promote, uh, it's kind of like a tax on pharma uh, to promote independent uh, medical education and each autonomous region has used that money differently but some have set up units to promote evidence-based healthcare training and I think it's a gr great use. That, say, that said, it's the system, we train a lot of people from pharma and I've run workshops from pharma and it's not the individuals, it's something about the system. And uh, that needs a, a political solution. Yeah. Giordano, do you want to? Yeah, uh, that happens in Mexico a lot. Uh, there's a, I, I feel, I don't have the stats with me, but maybe, maybe 100 or 99% of medical education or medical events are promoted by, by pharma. And when you approach the reps or the companies to try to organize something about teaching evidence-based medicine, I don't, I, I don't feel them open to do this. So 
it's a big obstacle there. Do, do you have, oh, you've lost your microphone. Um, I was going to say, well, perhaps other people might have a solution to that problem. There's a question just here, and then the question at the back. Um, I actually have two, two comments, one, one provoked by the current discussion. Uh, I teach periodically in China. Uh, I teach evidence-based medicine there. And people who are from Western universities sometimes have no idea how phenomenally expensive full access to publications are. In fact, they're not available uh, where I teach. So a number of um, illegal and improper devices are in place to, to get at the literature, which is a little embarrassing to deal with. But you, can't, you can't do it. You can't, you can't demonstrate to people that they can find the answers if they only seek. If, they don't, if, if we don't have worldwide access to the literature somehow, and that's a huge problem to address. Um, the comment that I had intended to make before this started was that um, I thought part of this discussion from its title would be about addressing the different cultures within us. Um, I envy people who sit across a desk on their own with a patient discussing evidence-based medicine. I'm a neonatologist and I work with teams and those teams bring different cultures with them. Uh, I, I consult the different consultants who may or may not embrace evidence-based medicine. They may be pure reductionists in their approach. And the teams that I work with, the respiratory therapists, the nurses, the physiotherapists, uh, have been trained in different cultures. Um, they have different learning cultures, and th if I say I'm going to have an evidence-based discussion, they will say, well, you choose your paradigm and we'll choose ours. So we could have a separate session next year on the cultures that are within us and how to deal with them. Very interesting. Amanda, I mean, you must have had that in Jordan of, of the different ways in which allied health professionals and clinicians and patients perhaps as well deal with evidence. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There's just as much um, heterogeneity within this country. And within, I mean, Paul mentioned it in his talk. He's saying that when he interviewed people for the podcasts, the, the evidence-based evidence -based and the culture around it was different from specialty to specialty. And I started running these workshops in 1993 when there was massive hostility to the whole concept of evidence-based healthcare. And I focused on how I could seduce people in. And I think there are thematic ways of getting people in. For example, everybody believes that what they're doing is right. And I said, well, why is it right? Well, because it helps people. I said, you mean more people will get better doing it your way? And so that once you've got that more in, you say, well, let's count the numbers. Are there more? And, and, you, can, and you can get in. And I don't actually think that there is as much diversity as people think there is. So we can get groups. I mean, we had a lot of debate last, last week in the EBM course about um, to what extent knowledge is socially constructed. And there were really were very positivistic students amongst us. And a lot of people criticize evidence-based healthcare for this kind of... But actually, most of us aren't like that. And we were trying to, you know, bring them around it just because you recognize that, you know, illnesses are expressed in different ways and even illnesses are, can be socially defined does not mean that you're not being evidence-based. So I think, the, I think these are important debates that we need to have. And I, I think the only thing that I would avoid is dogmatism, uh, really. Um, Giordana, what, what about similarly the, the, the problem of multi, multidisciplinary groups? One of the things I've, I've been doing is removing the term evidence-based. Once you remove the evidence-based, it's like you take a, a, a barrier and just ask them, that, does it work? How would you prove it that, it that it works? And just removing the label of evidence-based because we still have a lot of resistance to evidence-based medicine in Mexico. Could I ask you, sorry, if the microphone could come back, how, do you address that problem directly and, I mean, or do you just um, hope, to, hope it will go away? I mean, when you have your team groups, do you ever manage to get together and discuss exactly this problem of different learning styles and different attitudes and, or does it just have to be ignored? 
uh, it's ju just, a, just a little bit. Um, it's still very much the elephant or the moose or whatever your national animal is on the table uh, in a lot of war drones. Um, so it's a sensitive topic. Uh, people have real beliefs in their learning systems um, and they're very committed to them and they're not always the evidence-based systems and you do have to respect them. Yeah, and one may be unaware of one's own what one is carrying oneself as a, as a slightly imperialistic view of which is the right way. Thank you. At the back there. Yes, Amanda. Um, I appreciate the discussion on how various cultures receive um, the concepts and the process of evidence-based medicine. For example, just returning from Kazakhstan after many months there with the five medical schools and um, hospitals, the um, intracultural mentoring of the intern and the relationship with the knowledge and most of all the application of that knowledge uh, had to be tailored, as you know, to the specific culture. And my question to you is, in this transition, in going from the academic deductive to the clinical inductive problem solving, um, have you looked at how evidence-based medicine can be um, brought to light when you engage in a relational way the value of it? What I mean specifically is... Um, can you just repeat that last bit? Can, uh, can you... Okay, certainly. What we found uh, in our empirical evidence uh, over the last um, couple of years is that the intercultural indigenous community uh, very much needs a relationship with the person bringing in the knowledge, access to it, but also continuity. <coughs> and one thing that is lost is um, providing just um, the, the transparent internet to where they immediately can translate something from English to their, their native language is one aspect. But what is lost most of all is the uh, application of that knowledge, the use of it within their indigenous community. And specifically what we call it is um, reentry rejection. We also look at it as where they see themselves betraying their heritage. And so they see themselves as walking in both worlds. And um, in some of these remote areas and at-risk areas, they very much need the intercultural mentoring approach. So my question to you is, have you considered that mediation tool in the aspect of this transfer? A mediation you, tool in, in, for transfer of the knowledge where people <laughs> feel sometimes they're betraying their own right. cultural background. Here, here and in the States, to... we use the Egan model. Uh, at Harvard, we use the um, uh, situated learning. And of course, uh, Bygotsky is the mediation when you talk about the construction. So I was asking if um, you had actually um, considered and used the mentoring indigenous cultural yeah. approach meaning um, the people bringing the knowledge get out of the way. No. <coughs> we haven't had that situation yet, no. We don't, we don't have any, any experience in that. You're all right, Amanda. We don't want you to... <laughs> You've got water. Feel free to cough. <laughs> You're done. No, I was just saying that. I, we don't have any experience in mediating like that. But I mean, to some extent, with your, with your workshops, if there are two of you, there's always the person who's invited you, isn't there, mm -hmm. to come, uh, and therefore there is the potential for someone at least who has their feet in the local culture to, to provide that yeah, of course. combined approach. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's all sorts of people. So, for example, the first time I went to Poland, um, I was invited, and I was invited to speak to the Ministry of Health, and I was told about all these problems within the ministry, and I spent a whole day going through all the personalities all the issues, all the attitudes, and developing a talk that would gently lead them into my way of thinking. I mean, I'm terribly, you know, and, and it worked. And I ended up getting invited back several times. And the same thing happened in Hungary. Um, Rita was working with others, Rita Horvath, to set up some audit work. And she invited me over to talk to this group that you, and they didn't need audit. And, and, and we talked for a long time about what their attitudes were. And, um, you know, and I, set, I set up in my talk the night before traps that they fell into and that made them stop and think. And I think I, we spend as, at least as much time preparing a workshop and finding out 
why it's wanted and what are the hidden agenda as we do running it. We don't just come and churn out the same old workshop. Um, I, thank I you. don't know, but it's not quite what you're talking about, but that's, that's internally within. Quite a few the hands going up. There's a gentleman there and then a gentleman here. And then we have two lady and the lady there. So <laughs> starting at the back there, yep. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, about a year ago, I was invited to uh, be a, an online facilitator with uh, an initiative set up by Professor Dick Heller, who used to be based at uh, Manchester University, is now in, in Australia, uh, University of Newcastle. Um, he specializes in public health epidemiology, and the initiative was uh, to set up an online network and learning center for um, public health for people in underdeveloped countries um, and it's been going now for, for, for a while. My role is purely to facilitate um, one, of the one of the modules on evidence-based practice, specifically evidence-based searching and there are others who do it on critical appraisal and so on. The interesting approach which we took or which has been taken here is that um, it's open to anyone in any underdeveloped country uh, and so you get a, a, a mix of people from African countries, some Asian countries and so on. They, it's more about knowledge sharing, so it's less about imparting information and, and directing um, uh, courses in the, in, the, in the traditional sense. It's more about um, putting the onus on the individuals who participate in these courses to uh, bring forward their own ideas and the problems in their countries, etc. And for, the, for this sort of information to, to be shared, which is interesting because it's less, the whole problem about cultural sensibilities is bypassed um, because it's not a case of whoever is organizing the course trying to be um, culturally sensitive to the, those who are participating, but it's, it's putting the onus on the, the participants to share their differences and so on and their commonalities so uh, i think there's a great um opportunity here for on w with online learning courses we use moodle by the way um to uh take a totally different approach there so it's less about um imparting information and, and less about cultural sensibilities more about putting people in contact with each other uh, I, I'd just like to know what your comments are on that. Uh, and can I ask, what's the um, URL of the website? Uh, it's, if you, if you uh, Google People's Open Access Initiative. People's Open Access Initiative. That's right, yeah. You'll find it. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Um, I'm going to ask for the next question, and if we could comment on, um, if you bring the microphone to the gentleman here, and we'll have a few questions together. Hi. Uh, the, the, the method uh, that we're talking about here is, is the process itself of clinically appraising literature. Uh, it, it's like teaching a man to fish, and you will teach him forever. But I think at the moment, we really need more fish. And, and the methods that are suggested are quite difficult to do. I mean, you need expertise to do it to do it well and they're difficult to do it at the point of care people don't have access as many of uh, the previous comments <laughs> said don't have access to computers don't have access to full text literature and uh, they're busy with practice they see patients tons of patients and they don't really have to do it at the point of care so I thought that perhaps um, one way of doing this would be at the moment before that final thing happens is to provide them with fish, provide content, provide them with um, the methods to find them on the internet. Uh, most people now s say that uh, recent surveys that there are about five billion mobile phones and uh, the economist says that this has sort of narrowed the digital divide in using mobiles and uh, a lot of clinical practitioners have mobile, so 
this is probably perhaps the way of the future to uh, give access to healthcare practitioners, access mobiles, and uh, teach them how to find resources that are free on the internet. Okay, thank you. So we've got two questions there really about online access, <coughs> mobile access, and also search methodology. And we had the previous question about the problem of access to the literature. So Giordano, what's your feeling? Well, it's just about the same that the the doctor from, from Colombia said that we don't have access. I, I don't know, I feel that if there's an effort by the hospital, the institutions, or their government, we, we can get access. And part of what we're doing is doing workshops or internet workshops to teach these tricks or to find the, the free literature or open access literature, like he was saying. I don't know if that's yeah. related to it. And Amanda, what about search, teaching people how to search? Um, we, we do teach people how to search. I think it, there's a, a theme coming out about the need for public access, open access. Mm. And in fact, um, about stemming from an ethics debate we had about evidence-based healthcare in our course, I've made a decision now never to publish again in a journal where I don't have, it's not going to be open access, which means that I'm going to not be publishing in The Lancet and various other... You can they, publish in the VNJ. Should they want to publish my publication, which was, they probably never would have anyway, but yeah, so, I mean, even, even the Cochrane Library, I was disappointed when Wiley changed um, the thing that you have to sign to give them the copyright when you do a Cochrane review. So now I amend all my reviews when I sign that back and they write back to me and say, you can't do that. And I send back and say, well, I've just done it, you know. And, but I retain the copyright and then make sure I make it publicly available. So I think public access is really important. I know that there are, I think EBM and EBHC has been born with the computer era. It, it, it's an information um, driven, Muir always says that information is the next revolution and I think he's absolutely right and although some countries are lagging behind they, it's much cheaper to give someone internet access than it is to give them clean water and these technologies are spreading like wildfire and I think mobile technologies are spreading even faster and they can be used because when I promote evidence-based healthcare I don't want everyone to go out and get a paper and appraise it every time they want a decision. I just want them to understand the rules behind it and what are sources of good pre-appraised evidence. So they can go in and get a snappy answer quickly, you know, the, the, the success model. So I think that all these things will Can um, I just ask come on that point that Amanda's just raised? I mean, it's a smallish group here, but obviously a very high, high um, hitting group. How many of you have published in the last um, four years in an academic journal? Okay, and if you could keep your hand up if you published in an open access journal. Okay, I mean, I do think, I mean, I, I have a conflict of interest here. The BMJ is open access, and we've just launched this new journal called BMJ Open, but there's also the Biomed Central journals, and there's also PLOS uh, and other open access journals. Um, I do think that if people really feel seriously about access to um, information globally, that they ought to make a similar commitment to Amanda's. Um, but it's obviously down to the individual. But I think um, that we are talking about the fact that vast parts of the world um, do find it very hard to get access, despite things like Hinari and despite, um, you know, other, other, other initiatives. So it's just worth a thought. Um, well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if in the future, just like we say, what they experimented on patients without getting informed consent, we're only talking about a generation ago now, not a long time ago. People are going to say, well, they published in journals where people couldn't get access to the information. Yeah. I think it, it will have that, that people will look back and they'll shake their heads and how could we be so unethical? I think. I, I like to think. <laughs> like and, to. and I'd like to predict even further. We don't share our data. I want to go further. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. We have two questions, the lady there and then the lady in front. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Amanda and Giordano. That was very nice. Um, um, I've came across, I'm Lubna Al Ansari from Saudi Arabia. I've came across a Cochrane review that was updated recently, which shows that standalone courses are not as effective as they were thought, or maybe not effective at all. Uh, I'm not sure if CASP was included in that review, but I think you need to assess the outcome 
um, if that is possible in order to prove that possibly CASP is different. Uh, that was just a comment, but I have, I'm impressed by the cascade system that you have. And I just want to ask, how, how do you keep it running uh, when you don't have a budget, an allocated budget for it in one? Sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah. The funding, how do you keep it running when you don't have a budget for it? Um, uh, that's one, one question. And the other question is, how do you maintain the quality of trainers who are going to the peripheries and to here and there? Quality, How, uh, so quality control for yeah, the training, the training. Yeah, minimum criteria or minimum standards for trainers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Before you just hold the question, can we have a question from the lady in the row in front as well? We'll no? talk about that. So funding quality <laughs> control. <coughs> Hi, um, Kate Body Pen Clark. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I was interested in um, teaching EBM to different levels, and you mentioned teaching lay, um, lay people and consumers. Excuse me. And my question um, was, could you explain a little bit more about who they were and whether you had to modify your teaching um, at all? Thank you. So just to summarize, we've got standalone don't work. We've got what's how you manage without any money. Um, what quality control for training the trainers and then how, how you modify for lay people. So take, a, take your pick. <laughs> if you do it, then you'll have to remind me again. My short oh, okay. memory is hopeless. Well, the first one uh, about the funding and the quality control, I, I guess there isn't one. <laughs> uh, there is not, not quality control. We just invite one of the, the trainees. Uh, if they want to become facilitator first, then start giving the introduction or the discussion sessions, and they become involved. And, that's about it. And they, it but if you discovered they were, they were doing it all wrong, you wouldn't know that. And <laughs> you'd, you'd hear on the grapevine, I suppose, would you? I haven't encountered. Like, it, it doesn't work like that no. because the process is so slow that people do learn it. I mean, and I try and persuade people in training the trainer that the most disastrous teaching sessions are the best ones. And it's absolutely true. So somebody stands up to teach likelihood ratios and they get it all wrong and the group starts telling them they got it wrong and then they break it down and they disentangle it and they get it all right. People learn so much more from that mm -hmm. session than they ever learn from someone spieling off a perfect talk about likelihood ratios. Mm. And it doesn't matter that it, the system is so robust working in small groups you know, occasionally I've had to sit there when something's sort of taught wrong and, I'm, and I toy with the idea of do I correct this and undermine the person or do I... But it all comes out of the wash. What we need is to come through and do it more and more and more. I mean, I talk about confidence intervals, about where being 95% certain where the truth lies. I don't talk about it, well, if I did this experiment 100 times, 95% of the time. I don't... You know, you, you can break it down into simpler things. Now, there was a movement here of all the evidence-based people, this was about 10 years ago, and Ruth was at it, and we were all called together to get a, you know, a stamp and, and produce some certification of good evidence-based teacher. And I just thought, this is horrible. I don't want to be part of this group. I don't know what happened to it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's anathema to me. I think everybody should be teaching, and everyone's pride means that they, by teaching, they learn. It's by far the best way. And what about the, oh, sorry, Giordano. I just want to share something. In the first session that I, I was in with Amanda, the first discussion I gave, uh, I, I was kind of ner nervous. And so what if somebody I, of the 40, 50 people that are in the room asks, asked me something I don't know? And they just told me, just ask someone else. <laughs> Deviate the question and that's it. And all the group answers the questions. So. There's no quality control in Or that. stand up and say, I don't know. One of the things I'm trying to persuade people is to say, I don't know. I mean, I, it used to happen to me in Birmingham quite a lot. And I'd say, look, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll find a statistician in the coffee break, you know, and I'd try and find out the answer. Or we'd do it together. And what about the money? Because that's interesting to me. How do you survive? And, and, and how can we help? <laughs> I mean, not out of our own pocket, but can we... What would you like the community to do to make this all more available? Um, well, one thing I do, people like my teaching, right? So there are people who are willing to pay disproportionate amounts of time for my teaching, which always staggers me. And uh, 
so I will do the occasional teaching for these people and then I'll put the money um, into a, in a slush fund, I'm not allowed to use that term, into a, an account at the university and then I'll use it to cross fund trips to other countries or to help other people. And how do you, the, the, the train the trainers, how do the cascaded people, how do they fund themselves? Um, well, we'll go to those countries and they'll bring people. But how did, how did people travel from all over to get to Guanajuato? How did they pay for that? Most of them were paid with, from some hospitals. And so the hospitals have been convinced that it's worth them yeah. funding? Yeah. It, that's how it, it in is. Spain, it's spread by clinicians paying from their own pocket. And also, quite a, we won't take any money from pharma or... <laughs> not that pharma wants to give us any, but... Um, there are people who've come to the workshops a lot in Spain who have, farm has paid their but, and can, you, can you help with if people wanted to set up capital can you help them convince the hospital or the institution that they need to pay for this are there so mechanisms for Mo mostly they've been done out with the institution even though it's been held in the institution um, it's been done by driven by individuals I and mean, the first time I was in Mexico we, we were having to run syncopated workshops. There were so many people came, and after the first one, it sort of spread like wildfire. So we'd do the introductory talk, we'd set them off in small groups, we'd go into another lecture theatre, we'd do the introductory talk to another watch, set them off, go back, do the feedback. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And this was just people, people just turning up. Okay, um, got, just before we finish, two questions not yet answered. Standalone groups not working. Standalone. The whole, when you mean, you mean the face to face sitting in a lecture hall, that thing? Or? When it is uh, a workshop or a course for three days or five days, and that's it. Just no follow up, no integration into practice. Okay, so one off events don't work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one off events can inspire people, and it's amazing that. A few years later, someone will come back and they've been ploughing their own furrow. But mostly, I don't want to waste my time on one-off events because there's a, an infinite number of one-off events I could do. So I prefer to be more strategic and, and, and it's like an enzyme. If I can find somebody who's going to uh, cascade what I'm doing, then it makes, makes it more. But seeing you there reminds me of when I, I, I went to Iran, you know, because we think we're all so different and we're on a bus trip and we're going somewhere for the miraculous water. Is it, you know, it's, it's a tourist tour. And this miraculous water, it's been subject to a randomized control trial and it's actually been shown to reduce kidney stones. And I just think, you know, I just love it. I just love it. We, and the last question is about the, the, getting back to the cultural differences, about how you adapt things for the lay audience. Uh, adapting to the lay audience. To go back to that one I talked about, the maternity services liaison committees. These are committees with obstetricians, midwives, and women who've recently given birth, various groups of people. And we were supposed to train them all together. Well, we sent out the workshop packs, and we got all these, for the pilot workshop, we got all these women saying, oh, they think they've made a mistake, they're not coming. And we thought, oh, we've made a mistake. So we sort of quickly moved backwards. And we set up a weekend with just the lay people. And we'd sit there and I'd <clears throat> do these sort of things like sweets or I'd, you know, I'd say, you know, how, I'd bring, I've got this bottle of brain salts that, and I'd say, will you buy it off me like a snake dealer? And then we talk them through and then gradually get them to design I said, well, what sort of study would you want? They describe a study, and I would say, how could you get that result without this thing actually working? They said, well, it could be because this group are different. I said, well, how are you going to get the two groups the same? And then they'll come. And gradually, they themselves produce a double blind placebo controlled trial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interestingly, the reason I'm talking about the maternity services liaison committee is when that group of women who'd had one weekend chatting informally and confidence building and teach, I teach statistics with bags of sweets, came to the workshops with the consultants. The consultants were really annoyed and they said it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. Well, why should these women have had a leg up before this? So with one weekend of training, these women were whipping um, the, the um, medical profession. And I was at a talk by Steve Wallace in, um, last week. He came to talk to our students in Oxford and he threw away, he said, look, if the patients can do it, the doctors can do it. And, and they got sweets as well, which is an extra bonus. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amanda and Giordano, we must finish there. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for an excellent presentation. <laughs>